Hello, my name is uh, Joe Bita, and uh, welcome to session 313. This is uh, the technical details or sort of advanced Google Compute Engine. And uh, in this session, we're going to be going over in a little bit more depth uh, the different parts of, of Google Compute Engine, given uh, a little bit more meat on the bones of how things work. Uh, we're going to show some examples of um, real world applications and experiences. And then I'm going to take some time to dig into uh, some of the details uh, that make Google Compute in, uh, uh, Engine interesting and how to get the best use out of the product. Let's see. Oh, my little remote is. Uh, uh, this isn't good. There we go. OK. Um, Okay, so, so just a little bit of review. I, I want to I cover what exactly Compute Engine is. Um, it's infrastructure as a service provided by Google. And, uh, and when people think infrastructure, they usually start thinking about virtual machines. And it's a very important part of what we're doing. Uh, but it's only part of the picture. So we're, we're going to cover the virtual machines, but I also want to talk about the network storage and tools that go along with it. And this really, you know, this, this completes the picture. And so, uh, um, you know, and I think we have interesting offerings at, at each of these levels. And, uh, and for, uh, you know, and we're, we're launching in limited preview today. And uh, as part of that limited preview, we're concentrating on large uh, uh, computationally intensive batch workloads. And as we continue to develop the product, we're going to expand uh, the scope of that program and uh, the type of workloads that we take on and are, and are appropriate for running on, on Compute Engine. So one of the things that I think really makes Compute Engine interesting is that it builds on top of Google's infrastructure and Google's experiences. And, uh, and this really breaks down four different ways. So the first thing is one of scale. And I think you saw this you know, very dramatically with uh, Urz's keynote this morning. Uh, about sort of how much you know, scale we really have at Google. And, uh, and we're really excited to start bringing some of that uh, capacity uh, online so that you can start taking advantage of it. Um, the next thing is speed. Um, Google's infrastructure is optimized for search. This is, this, is a, uh, uh, this is an industry where one millisecond translates to millions of dollars. And we've uh, spent years uh, optimizing our infrastructure both at the uh, uh, software and hardware level, um, and especially our networking systems, to be able to provide low latency, uh, high bandwidth, enormous services uh, at, a, at a really unique scale. And there's really um, there's no other provider out there that actually brings together that level of scale, that global footprint, and the comprehensive set of services that we have. The next thing is really you know, our, our global footprint. And, and um, this is not just uh, in terms of where we have uh, data centers and where we have presence. It's really about our networking. And this comes into play in so many different ways in terms of, of communicating between virtual machines that are in different regions or how your traffic gets from your virtual machine to uh, the, uh, any end user uh, uh, out on the internet. And, and finally, we have a uh, comprehensive and growing and well-integrated platform uh, of services. And this stretches from everything from App Engine to Google Cloud Storage to BigQuery to Translate to Maps and all sorts of other APIs. And Google Compute Engine complements these by allowing you to run your code in a familiar environment close to where these APIs uh, uh, endpoints are. So I'd want to review a little bit, if you were at the uh, earlier talk, Craig McLucky's talk, um, he covered some of this stuff. But I, I want to go over it again very quickly. Um, what are the things that we thought about as we built Compute Engine? And I think you'll see these themes really reoccur you know, as we give some concrete examples. So the first thing here is that we built Compute Engine to be as secure as possible from the get-go. We really thought about security deeply, um, even in the very early days of the product. And this really manifests itself in terms of providing a uh, secure, isolated uh, virtual network for each individual application or project, uh, to encrypting all data at risk as it uh, is written to or read from with the, uh, the virtual machine. 
The next thing is we want things to be open and flexible and familiar. And this applies both at the control layer. Our API, uh, while it's, it's a Google Compute Engine specific API, we've built it to, to leverage well-known concepts and to be familiar. Um, but also within the virtual machine, uh, we provide a familiar environment so that you can get, get up and running as quick as possible. The next point is really around consistency. Um, if you build an application and you test it and it works, you want to actually feel that it's going to continue to work. And so Google has a deep uh, uh, expertise in terms of running shared workloads internally across all of our infrastructure for our own applications. And we've applied a lot of the same technology there to actually provide a, a, a really uh, amazing level of consist consistency uh, for our virtual machine product. And, um, and finally, we want you to know, or not finally, we have two more points, proven. <laughs> we have, uh, uh, we're running uh, real workloads on this infrastructure today. And we're gonna have an example uh, in, this, uh, in this talk uh, from one of our, our early, uh, early uh, usages internally. But, um, but this, is not, uh, this is not a beta product. Um, this is actually something that is in use. Um, there's real Google revenue flowing through these, this product today. And we're offering the same exact product to you. Um, and then finally, we wanna actually enable an ecosystem. We wanna be able to have partners uh, and, 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 uh, and be able to leverage open source systems that are, already exist. And again, this is either from outside the, the, uh, the system at the API level, but also what's running inside the virtual machine. So um, to jump right in, um, I'm gonna invite up uh, uh, Evan Anderson, who's uh, another member of, uh, of our team, to, uh, to give you a quick uh, uh, hello world type demo. Evan? So I'm going to be using our command line tools to start up a new virtual machine and then show you a little bit about how the API works and log in, show you a few features. And um, you can do all of these same things through our web API, um, through our web UI. But in this case, I'm going to use the command line so that you can sort of see a little bit more about how things happen. So. Um, each virtual machine has a name, and you can associate, you may have seen Chris X talk earlier, um, various permissions with each VM. So in this case, I'm going to say that I want access to Google Storage, and I want it to be, want read write access. And it will prompt me saying, okay, which of these um, zones would you like to launch your virtual machine in? And which virtual machine type would you like to launch? So I'm gonna launch a four CPU VM, and we've submitted the request to start this instance, and our API says, okay, this is, instance is in the process of being started. Um, you can query and get the status of this instance, and you can see that right now it is staging, and you can also use this tool while you're sort of debugging or figuring out how this API works to actually get the JSON output. And you can see there's a bunch of properties that the summary um, tells you the interesting and useful stuff if you're a person, but you may be interested in things like an ID if you're a program. So I'm going to SSH into this VM and install a software package called Context Free, which is used to generate algorithmic um, graphics. So so this is just a standard Ubuntu Linux VM, and I've got access to all of the Ubuntu packages. Obviously, I could also build something of my own. And I'm gonna generate a 2000 by 2000 image um, of a Sierpinski um, gasket that is one of the context-free demos. And so, you know, my virtual machine is going, generating, you know, a bunch of fractals, and it's done. Um, one other thing I'll note, we talked earlier about how I named this virtual machine demo. You can see that the host name is actually also set to be demo. 
Um, we do this via DHCP, so it should work, you know, with most standard Linux installations. And I could just, you know, copy this back or sort of run Apache or something like that to show you how this works. But I'm going to actually copy this to Google Storage that I gave permissions to earlier and make it publicly readable so anyone can see it. And so this gets copied, and as you can see, it's a only one and a half megabytes, so it's pretty fast. And then we can go and look at it um, at common data storage. And this should load after a few moments. And here is the Sierpinski triangle. Um, as you can see, access to Google Storage is a little bit faster from this virtual machine than it is from my laptop. But it's loading, and I think we left the wireless on. <laughs> oh, that's the mistake. That would do it. <laughs> yeah, that'll so, do it. <laughs> so, as you'll you'll note when we're actually interacting with most of this stuff, we've been using Google Storage because it's close and it's local, and not using stuff on your local workstation because it's further away. And with that, um, we'll let Joe get back to the slides. And Joe will tell you a bit more about how that actually comes to be. Actually, I'm going to, you'll have to excuse me for a second here. Let's um, go through and uh, turn off the wireless. And I, I am plugged in here, so let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, OK, so um, thank you, Evan. Hopefully, that gives you a taste of how uh, Compute Engine works and the familiar environment, and then also some of the seamless connections to other Google services. We're going to go into a lot more detail on a lot of what you just saw, but I just wanted to, to jump in real quick there. So let's cover the architecture of Google Compute Engine. So I'm going to talk about all the main pieces and how they fit together and give you as much detail as I can fit into this talk. Um, and so I have a diagram that shows, uh, you know, and this is, this is based on the, the diagram that, uh, that Craig had in his earlier talk. Um, but I'm going to go through this piece by piece and add as much detail as I can here. So it really starts with the API. Um, and this is the model for the different things that you can touch and mess with and, and, and modify and inspect uh, with the system. And this is an HTTP, uh, a JSON over HTTP API. It's REST inspired. And uh, we, you authorize to that with OAuth2, like pretty much every other API at Google. And, um, and the concepts here are very familiar. I think there's probably one or two you know, new things on this list, and we can cover those. But, uh, uh, but we tried not to reinvent the wheel in terms of sort of the basic structure and concepts of an infrastructure service. So calling this API is, you know, you can always you know, um, be a real hacker and write uh, your JSON by hand uh, into uh, Telnet. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but most people want some help doing that. And so we, you saw the command line tool that Evan had uh, uh, was using earlier. Um, we're not going to cover it in this talk, but, um, but we also have a web UI. And, um, and then we have a set of libraries. And th these are both the, the standard li Google API libraries that work across a whole slew of, uh, of APIs. But we've also worked to build a very easy to use Python based API um, that's really hand tuned to, to, to provide a great experience. Um, all of these things are open, um, and they use the API. Uh, directly, so we're not cheating and going around and making an end run and using special calls. And so the API really is the interface to the product. And uh, and that web UI itself is built on top of App Engine. And so this is a great example of how App Engine uh, it can drive the Google Compute Engine API uh, to provide uh, you know orchestration or uh, administration. And finally, we have a uh, 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 we have partners and an ecosystem. And so they're using the API itself to actually be able to provide services on top of Compute Engine on your behalf. And so, um, you know, if you were at the previous talk, you saw the, the demo from WriteScale, but we've also been working with um, uh, Puppet and Ops Code. And then there's a whole slew of, of systems built up around cloud management that, that are, are welcome to use this API, and we hope to really foster an ecosystem there. And so that's both, again, at the API level, but also what's going on inside of the virtual machine. 
Now, there's this concept of a project, and uh, everything that happens in Compute Engine ha happens within the context of a project. Uh, Evan, in his example, actually had a, a, a sort of an any file set up so that there was a default project there. Um, and the project is a container for all these resources. Uh, there's a set of members that are associated with that project. In some ways, it's very similar to an App Engine app. Um, but the idea here is that these things are owned by the project, not by people. And, uh, and so whenever there's an action on the API, it's actually traced back to a person instead of an anonymous set of credentials. And so actually, you know, keeping this, this th sort of identity of who's operating with the API is, is uh, we think, a very unique and powerful feature. And if the API is the sort of front door to the product, the, uh, the virtual machine is definitely the heart of, of what we're doing here. And so we're offering Linux virtual machines. You get root access on these machines. You saw Evan um, you know, install a package uh, uh, from Ubuntu. And um, one thing that we should note is that we are locking down the Linux kernel. And this is really for reasons of security and performance. We've actually tuned that kernel to work very well with our networking environment. And uh, we're offering a couple of stock images uh, based off of uh, Ubuntu and CentOS. And, uh, and you're free to customize these and build your own custom images. Or if, you, you know, if, you're, uh, if you're a real hacker, you can build your own Linux distribution by like, you know, hand carving bits. Um, and, uh, and so our images, we've done a couple of things. We've installed a couple of utilities by default, things like the gsutil that Evan was calling, just so that you know, that stuff is ready and, and, and uh, ready to go. And we've done a little bit of security lockdown, as things like turning off password authentication and only relying on SSH keys or turning on automatic security updates. Now, what do you get when you, uh, when you actually buy a virtual machine from Google Compute Engine? Well, the first thing is that you're getting a, uh, actually a really impressively fast uh, Intel uh, uh, 2.6 gigahertz Sandy Bridge processor, Xeon processor. We offer these things in one, two, four, and eight uh, uh, virtual CPU configurations. And we map one of these virtual CPUs to a hyperthread. And so if you get uh, a two uh, CPU instance, you'll get both halves of a real physical core. Um, we're offering 3.75 gigabytes of RAM uh, per virtual CPU, and th that scales up linearly. And, uh, and we're offering a, a significant amount of what we're calling ephemeral or local storage. And if you buy one of the bigger instances, so the, these are the, uh, the four or the eight uh, core instances, you also uh, are provided with dedicated spindles. And so this actually comes back to this level of consistency. If you know that you're the only one reading and writing from that disk, you're going to get a lot more predictable performance. As part of this launch, we're defining um, a, a new uh, performance metric uh, called the Google Compute uh, uh, Engine uh, Unit, or the GQ, I think is the, the cute name for it. And we've built this to approximate an ECU as, uh, as best we could figure it. And so as far as, we're, uh, as we can determine, you know, we're rating uh, our virtual CPUs at 2.75 GQs uh, per, per instance, I mean per virtual CPU. And we're also working on smaller machine types for prototyping and debugging. And so the, those will be forthcoming. Um, I want to go into a little bit of detail of sort of what's going on under the covers and the technology stack that we've uh, chosen and what we're building on. You may not know it, but Google actually has a, uh, a great kernel engineering team. We actually have a lot of expertise with the Linux kernel. And we'll, we really leveraged these guys when, uh, when we started looking at which virtualiz virtualization technology one we wanted to build on. And we ended up going with a combination of kernel virtual machines, or KVM, and Linux C groups. So KVM is really... Um, uh, a, a great uh, and, and relatively recent entrance into the virtualization world. And, uh, and it's, it's interesting because it actually reuses the Linux kernel to actually play the role of hypervisor. And so you're, you end up reusing the, um, the, the Linux uh, memory manager and scheduler to actually manage the memory and the scheduling of the, the, of the uh, virtual machines. So one of the great advantages that you get out of this is that you can run both uh, virtualized and non-virtualized workloads on the same kernel and perhaps even on the same machine. And so you know, with the number of machines that, that Google manages, this is you know, having one single kernel that we deploy and that we test is a huge, huge advantage. Um, and so we worked, uh, uh, we worked closely with Red Hat, and we really appreciate the leadership that they've shown in terms of getting KVM where it's at today. And, uh, and we're going to be looking to engage further with Red Hat and the KVM community. So stay tuned uh, as we detail uh, our, our involvement there. Now, the other piece of this puzzle is this feature called Linux C Groups. 
So KVM provides virtualization. C groups provides resource isolation. And this is something that was pioneered by the, the, the Google kernel team, and it's been released uh, open source for quite a while now, and it's used very, very widely at Google. So this is an example of Google reusing technology that we've built to solve some of our own problems uh, uh, across our own set of, of requirements, but reapplying this into the virtualization world. And so, um, so you know, we have a, a lot of experience in terms of making sure that we can, we can keep workloads isolated from each other, and Linux C groups is a, is a, a big part of that. So moving away from the virtual machines themselves, I want to talk a little bit about our networking. So each project gets its own private virtual network. You don't share this virtual network with anybody else. And this virtual network actually spans across all of your virtual machines, no matter where they are. So we think that's a really interesting property. So that means that if you have a virtual machine running in, in, uh, you know, in, in the east coast of the United States, and you have another one running in, you know, in, in central US, and they can be hundreds or thousands of miles away, they can talk to each other over this secure private virtual network. And, um, and, and all that traffic, instead of going through the wild west of the internet, actually goes over Google's you know, highly managed uh, uh, secure private network. Um, this is uh, uh, inside of this, this virtual network, you're going to see um, uh, uh, private IP addresses, RFC 1918 addresses. These are like 10 dot uh, type of addresses. And, uh, and this network is all uh, IP uh, layer three, or layer, uh, layer three IP la level networking. So that means that we, uh, you can be sure that if you get a packet and it comes from a particular IP address, that it really came from that virtual machine on your private network. Now, beyond the sort of flat geographical regions, which we think is a great feature, there's, uh, uh, we've, we've also worked to actually bridge the gap between the API, what's happening at the API level, and what's happening inside the virtual machine. And so, as you saw with Evan's uh, demo, when we name a virtual machine demo, or you, know, you name it foo, or whatever you want to name it, worker number 37, that gets propagated into the virtual machine, so it becomes that virtual machine's host name. Not only do we that, do that, but we actually overlay the DNS that's provided to that virtual machine, so that your virtual machines can use those host names to find each other. When you're actually bringing up a distributed system, naming is a really, really hard thing to get right, and it's really important. Uh, uh, it's really useful to actually have the system provide sort of that substrate of naming that you can take advantage of. This is actually a, a lesson that Google's learned well as we've built larger and larger systems. Moving away from the private virtual network, uh, I want to talk about how our virtual machines get access to the internet. So every uh, virtual machine can be assigned an IP address, and it gets uh, full use of that IP address. Um, it, it won't show up if you do like IF config inside the VM, but instead as your traffic exits or enters from your virtual network to the internet, we actually rewrite the, uh, that IP address using NAT. We're calling this one-to-one -one NAT because it's, it's not doing the port mapping that you'll find uh, is, is relatively common with NAT. Um, these external IP addresses, similar to the global footprint of our virtual networks, actually float between regions also. So this means that you can actually detach an IP address from a VM running in one region and reattach it to another VM running in a different region that may be hundreds or thousands of miles away. And Google automatically takes care of making sure that the traffic gets to the right destination. In addition, we have a built-in firewall system so that, you know, again, this threat of security when we want to make sure that as you start your virtual machine, you don't get any surprises with respect to traffic that you're not expecting. And Google, and, and this, this utilizes, again, Google's global network footprint. And so what happens is that no matter where in the world this traffic is coming from, as soon as we can, we get it onto Google's network, and it gets a first-class ticket from wherever in the world it is to your virtual machine. And so instead of actually, you know, you know, dealing with, again, sort of the chaos that is the Internet at large, we try and actually eliminate that, provide as much consistency, as much performance as we possibly can. So again, this brings in consistency. We want to make sure that, that we can provide a great experience no matter what's going on you know, uh, uh, with respect to the sort of weather of the network currently. And then uh, finally, a, a couple of limitations I want to mention. We're restricting outgoing email access SMTP traffic as an abuse measure. If, uh, if, uh, if, if you have a, a need for that, we're going to evaluate it on a case-by-case on a -case basis. And, um, and we're, well, you can do any sort of IP level traffic between instances on the private virtual network. We're only supporting UDP, TCP, and ICMP for uh, network traffic to the internet at large. So shifting away from networking 
I want to talk about storage. Uh, it's, it's probably as important, if not more important, than networking. And so the, the first thing I want to highlight is, is what we've been calling persistent disk. Um, and so this is, is storage that builds on top of Google's deep experience with storage infrastructure and, uh, and provides a, a virtual hard drive that uh, outlives the lifetime of your instance. And we, uh, uh, we've built this from the ground up to be as fast and as consistent as we possibly can. We've really sort of started measuring things out to like, you know, the 99.999th percentile and looking at the latencies there. And, um, and so this is provisioned just like instances. So whereas Evan called gcutil add instance, you can call add disk also. And, uh, and these things are actually located within a zone, uh, similar to instances also. Now you can mount these things read-write to a single instance, or you can mount them read-write to a whole bunch of instances. And we think that being able to actually have a, a static data set that you can mount read-only uh, read is, is a really interesting feature. We're also encrypting all of the data coming from your virtual machine uh, before it actually gets written anywhere persistently. Um, and this is a really important feature uh, for just peace of mind. And because we're building on these, these newer processors, we can do this with essentially you know, the very little to no uh, overhead. And so it's essentially, you know, in, in transparent to you, we're making sure that your data gets encrypted before it gets written down. Okay, so a number I wanna share um, with respect to consistency and the persistent disk product. Uh, I, we've measured this in less than 3% um, variance on I.O. bandwidth when doing um, 4K random reads and writes. And, uh, and, and with local disk, you can actually see this vary by as up, to, up to 13%. So this is very, very consistent. Not only that, but when you're doing large block read and writes, you can actually see you know, up to, I think, triple, triple the, the overall bandwidth as what you would get to local disk. And so we're really, really proud of this, this persistent disk product, and we're really happy with where it's at. Uh, but sometimes you don't need that persistent data. Something, sometimes you need something local that's sort of you know, cheap and cheerful, I think was the phrase that Craig used. And in that case, we have uh, local storage or ephemeral storage. This is tied to your instance. It lives and dies with the instance. Currently, all of our instances are booting off of this. We're going to be looking at booting off of the persistent disk product in the future. And, uh, and you get a lot of it, um, you know, up to you know, three and a half terabytes with the, the uh, eight CPU instance. And again, um, with the larger instances, you're going to get dedicated spindles. Um, uh, one spindle with the, uh, 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 with the uh, four CPU instance, and then two spindles with the eight CPU instance. And just like the persistent disk, we, we encrypt this at rest. And that, that key that actually encrypts it actually never leaves the machine that the VM's sitting on. Now, I also want to talk about Google Cloud Storage. Now, this isn't part of Google Compute Engine proper. Um, but it's kind of a sister project, product that, uh, that we've worked well to integrate with. And this is a internet object store. It has its own HTTP API for getting and setting values into it. And it's a great feature, it's a great service for getting data in and out of Google's cloud. You don't have to, you don't have to think about managing your data. It's really, uh, you know, a lot of automatic sort of, you know, management and replication is happening for you. And we have this feature that I'm going to talk to a little bit later, and I think you saw it with, uh, with Evan's demo called service accounts, that really make it frictionless to use this. You don't have to think about you know, uh, propagating credentials and making sure that those don't leak and things like that. And so uh, Google Cloud Storage also takes advantage of Google's global, global infrastructure. And not only do you get that first class ticket for your packets to anywhere in the world, but you also um, uh, get caching. So we have, uh, if your objects are publicly readable, we can cache them very close to where they're going to be used, and you get like CDN-type performance out of that. Um, and then finally, I mentioned zones. I just want to mention this for completeness. We have this idea of a region, which is uh, geography and routing domain. And then we also have a zone, which is really all about fault tolerance. For this limited preview, we're launching in three zones, uh, spread across the central and eastern United States. Um, and we're going to be looking to expand that as, uh, as the product develops. So with that, uh, that's sort of the basics of the sort of overview of systems for uh, Google Compute Engine. But I'd like to give you a real idea of, of what it looks like to run an application on top of Compute Engine. And with that, I'd like to, to introduce Hamza Ka uh, Kaya, who is uh, with Invite Media, to tell us about his experience of uh, working with Compute Engine. Hamza? Thank you, Joe. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Invite Media is a demand-side platform that allows uh, advertisers buy from multiple ad exchanges in real time. 
since everything happens on real time, we have to deal with two, many, uh, two main challenges. The first one is uh, we need to buy as many uh, ad requests as possible uh, to multiple ad exchanges. As you can imagine, these results in a very high volume of traffic. Uh, to give you an idea, Invite these days handles close to 400K queries per second. And uh, the second challenge is that uh, we need to return a valid response back to the exchange within a very short time period. Usually this is uh, 150 milliseconds, including the network round trip time. Uh, handling many ad requests uh, with this short period of time uh, is definitely a challenging task and requires good computing power and a consistently good uh, networking. Uh, Invite Media has been uh, using the same uh, infrastructure provider since the beginning, and recently we started to ev evaluate Google Compute Engine as an alternative. Uh, initially, uh, we wanted to build a test cluster on a Google Compute Engine to see how uh, things are working on uh, Google Compute Engine. Uh, and uh, what we saw was uh, pretty familiar to our existing system. Uh, basically, you have instances running Linux, and you can attach uh, disks. You, you can assign static IPs. You can provide a startup script. And you have a nice uh, API, which is well documented and easy to use. Uh, with this familiar model, uh, we, we managed to uh, port our system to Google Compute Engine, and it was fairly simple and quick. Uh, we, we only spent two weeks of engineering time to build a fully functional cluster and start serving traffic on uh, Google Compute Engine. And uh, honestly, uh, two weeks is the time we usually spend whenever we need to expand our uh, operation to another uh, region within our existing provider. So. Uh, I'd like to uh, share some of the results that we achieved through our initial test run. Uh, so uh, after we set up the test cluster, we decided to actually serve a portion of our production traffic through Google Compute Engine. And uh, we, we use eight core instances on both our existing provider and the Google Compute Engine. On our existing provider, a single eight core instance can handle up to 350 queries per second while respecting the uh, latency requirements. And on, on the other hand, on Google Compute Engine, a single instance can handle up to 650 queries per second. Uh, that's pretty impressive. And uh, with that, uh, we, we, manage, we, we used to uh, serve that portion of traffic with 284 machines, whereas after migrating to Google Compute Engine, we, we are currently serving with only 140 machines, which is essentially helping our number of servers that we need to manage. Another point that I want to talk about is uh, we have observed a consistently good network performance on Google Compute Engine. Uh, when we receive an ad request, we have uh, 10 milliseconds to uh, find out an, an uh, available backend server and establish a connection to it. Uh, when we fail to uh, obeying, uh, when fail to establish a connection in 10 milliseconds, this usually uh, counts as a connection error. Uh, with our current provider, uh, we we uh, we we usually have. 5% of connection errors. So we, we, we error out 5% of our requests. With Google Compute Engine, this error rate decreased to under a half percent. So that's quite an achievement. And another point is that uh, with our current provider, we uh, time out the incoming requests, 11% uh, of the incoming requests, which means that uh, we cannot return a response back to ex exchange uh, within the given uh, time limit. On Google Compute Engine, this error rate decreased to 6%, and uh, which means that essentially we have now 5% five more, 5 more uh, ad requests that we can buy for our advertisers. 
And uh, after seeing these uh, results, uh, we uh, decided to uh, migrate our entire operation to uh, Google Compute Engine, and currently we are in the process of uh, moving globally to Google Compute Engine. Uh, with that, I and uh, that's all I have to say today. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Hamza, and, and I really appreciate you being an early user of the system and giving us a, a lot of great feedback. Um, so the next uh, example that we want to give is uh, a, a system that was written by actually you know, an intern that started with us about, about a month ago uh, named uh, Dustin Carlino. He's uh, back in Seattle. And this is uh, a, a sample application. We're going to be releasing the code for that for running Hadoop on top of Compute Engine. And uh, I'd like to introduce Evan again to, to run through uh, how this system works. Evan? So I'm going to start by outlining how the application is designed. And then we will, boom. Um, that then we will actually start up a Hadoop cluster. And we'll run a job. and. All of this code, as Joe mentioned, is going to be released as example code in the future. So I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, but you will have a chance later to actually pour over the code and see how all of it works. So um, the design allows for either a command line or an app engine um, front end to talk to the Google Compute API. And the first step is to launch a coordinator instance which th we package up some data, and we push it to Google Compute Engine. And then it starts up and begins configuring itself. And once the coordinator has launched, um, it exposes a REST JSON API, which can be used to actually set up the rest of the cluster. So we're using one virtual machine to drive the setup of all of the other virtual machines and provide monitoring and status information and so forth. So right now, the coordinator just started running. Um, so it will take a few minutes for it to download all of the packages it needs and start up and um, get the actual application service running. Um, this is booting from a fresh um, Ubuntu image, like in my previous demo. There is no special software. Um, except for what's running after, um, you know, in this coordinator bundle. And Joe will talk about more about how that works. So the controller is up. And now I'm going to request that this coordinator start up the rest of the cluster. And so this starting up the Hadoop cluster um, involves requesting that the coordinator download all the Hadoop software um, and then stage it onto Google Storage so that all the rest of the nodes can read it very quickly and also so that we don't overwhelm our friendly local Apache Mirror. Um, so we've built a, a fairly, you know, a, a cluster that's only about 100 nodes or so, but um, we've requested the coordinator start spinning up nodes. And as you can see, it's keeping track of all of the nodes that it's already launched and the nodes that, you know, and the status of the nodes that have been launched. Um, there are moving from provisioning to staging, and you'll see some other steps. And then it's launching additional ones through the API when it decides that it's, you know, that, that things are making enough progress. Um, so all of this is work is being done on the coordinator node. If I were to kill this script, the coordinator would just keep going along setting up the cluster. Um, as you can see, several of these nodes have gotten to running. Running means that the virtual machine has booted, and it's downloading Java. It's downloading Hadoop. It's installing Java and Hadoop. It's waiting for the agent to start running on these machines, which we use for additional control that the coordinator uses. And that's this snitch ready state. Um, the script will exit once it has a sufficient quorum of nodes available. So you can see the Hadoop name node just came up, and now it's ready to be part of Hadoop. The job tracker is still coming up. Once the job tracker and the name node are up and there are enough slaves, 
the script will say, okay, you can start launching Hadoop jobs now, even though the rest of the cluster isn't up yet. Um, and then, so it's, it's just gonna finish now because it says, hey, we've got some slaves up and we've got the Hadoop masters up, so that's enough for you to start running Hadoop jobs if you want. And as I said, all this will be available as sample code, but one of the nice additional features of having this separate controller is that you can ask it, hey, what's the status of the cluster? And you can see now we have something like 41 Hadoop nodes, and as they make progress, um, we're up, we still have 44. Um, but that's fine, 44 is enough to start our job with, and as the rest come online, they will just get added to the cluster. So I'm going to launch a job that, um, on the Hadoop master that, um, wow, I just got really loud, sorry. Um, I just, I'm gonna launch a job on the Hadoop master that downloads 60 gigs of compressed XML data of Wikipedia revisions, and then um, it, uh, sorry. Um, so we'll go and take a look at that in the job tracker first, and then I will explain how it works. And I don't wanna let this go too long because Hadoop will make short work of it with 94 nodes. And um, so one node, it looks like it's still setting up. But this downloads 60 gigs of compressed Wikipedia edit history. And this is all the history of Wikipedia for the last several years of all the edits that have been made. And you could do a lot of interesting stuff with this, um, training machine learning, training language algorithms, um, analyzing social graphs or other sorts of behavior like that. And you can see we're 22% done right now. And this has a tendency because it's only got 300 jobs or so to run to jump at the end as all the jobs get done at the same time. Um, we just went from 22 to 77%. So this slices all the Wikipedia da data up into CSV format, which is great for exporting to Google BigQuery. Um, and I will show you in a moment how that would work once you've done that. Obviously, you could run other interesting algorithms. Um, and you can see here, um, the job is done. It took one and a half minutes, and we wrote 70 gigabytes of data into HDFS at the end of this. Um, so now, if we load this data into Google BigQuery, um, we can ask some interesting questions like, which Wikipedia articles have had the most edits over time? And so we ask, you know, we say, okay, um, and you can see that there are a lot of potentially controversial topics here. Um, and if we look through the results, um, we'll see, oh hey, there's some interesting things here. Like, it looks like people are more interested in making edits on Britney Spears' page than they are about the Catholic Church. So, who's been making all these edits? Well, with BigQuery, you can dig in and you can find the top editors of the Britney Spears page. And obviously, you could do lots of other interesting things. The great thing with BigQuery is it lets you do these sorts of interactive, hey, I wonder, sorts of questions, and then that can guide your later development of additional Hadoop jobs to mine interesting data. So, you know, we discover some interesting patterns doing a couple of queries, and we say, I wonder if that's true for all Wikipedia users. Well, now you can, can build your Hadoop job, and you can find the answer in a couple of minutes. And with that, I'm gonna let Joe get back to talking about how all of this is put together and the magic and unique features behind the scenes that let you do this seamlessly. Thank you very much, uh, Evan. I think that, that uh, does a great job of showing how uh, Google Compute Engine can run familiar code to actually solve new problems, yet also integrate with the other set of uh, cloud services that we're offering. So I want to talk about some of the features that actually make this possible. And I think we've alluded to this to a couple of times, but uh, I, want to, I want to go into some detail on what a service account is. Um, 
like I said, every call that actually comes into the uh, Google API, and pretty much any API, is based on OAuth 2, and it's tied back to a user. But what if you want to make a call to that, that API from code, right? You do take your like, Gmail password and put it in your, your uh, VM. That's probably not a great idea. So instead, what we did is we invented this concept called service accounts. And these, it's, this is a synthetic identity for VMs and codes. So your code actually sort of is its own user, and hopefully it'll, like, you know, maybe one day it'll come and take over and, you know, decide they don't need the humans. But, um, but uh, 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 the great example here is uh, Google Compute Engine calling other Google APIs, whether that be Google Storage or whether it be the Task Queue Pull API, which is part of App Engine. Um, and then App Engine also supports service accounts. And so you can use App Engine to call the Google Compute API to, to do all sorts of interesting orchestration. And so we think that these things really uh, complement each other, and it actually stitches together to make a, a, a great seamless uh, platform. Um, so here's, here's some, uh, uh, just put some meat on the bones here. Um, you, you've seen some of the syntax already when uh, Evan launched his first example. When we launch a, a virtual machine, we're providing the service account scopes, and you see storage-rw there. That's actually an alias for a full OAuth 2 scope. And, uh, and then when you uh, SSH into that machine, you can start running the Google storage utility. It's actually modified to automatically grab its credentials from uh, a, uh, a special metadata server that's available only to the, to the virtual machine. And you can just seamlessly uh, uh, communicate with Google Storage without having to worry about further configuration or passwords. And so this is a great example of how we've taken these a la carte services but made them actually work well together. So the next feature here is uh, instance metadata. So this is uh, a, a, a little bit of a, of a twist on a, on a familiar concept in the infrastructure world. But we're providing a, a set of key value pairs that you set at the API that are then available and exposed into the virtual machine. And so in this way, you can take a single image, and it can specialize itself at runtime to do what it needs to do based on the metadata that's passed into it. And so that's exactly how the Hadoop example that, that Evan just showed uh, can take sort of a generic image and, and uh, from that bootstrap everything up to installing Hadoop. And uh, so this metadata is, is accessible from within the virtual machine at a special server called Metadata. That's very creative. And, uh, and this server is a private uh, HTTP server just for that virtual machine. Nobody else sees that metadata except for that particular virtual machine. This is great for configuration data. And, um, and we also have this support for uh, project-wide metadata. And so you can set a, a key value pair that will then get inherited in, into all of these instances. And so this is the mechanism that we use to push your SSH keys into the virtual machine at boot up time. Uh, so there's nothing magical going on there. Just our default image knows how to read a special metadata value called SSH keys and then goes through and installs those into the, uh, into the virtual machine. Now, here's, here again is a little bit of code to show how this works. Um, so here, we're launching an instance, uh, and we're providing two metadata values here. One of them is a simple key value pair with some short strings called role and master. And then the other one is a, uh, a, a, the key is config, and then the actual contents of that is in this text file called config.txt. And then what you can do is, uh, as, oh, from within the virtual machine here, you can actually go through and hit up this metadata server. Uh, curl is a simple utility that downloads from HTTP from the command line, and you get that metadata back. It's a pretty simple concept, but it's really, really powerful for customizing virtual machines at boot time. So we've built on top of this further with this idea called startup scripts. And uh, this utilizes the, both the metadata and support that we've built into the virtual machine such that uh, you can provide a, a, essentially a program that gets run on startup. It's, it's very similar to RC Local if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, Unix startup uh, uh, semantics. And so you can use this to install your software to uh, uh, grab like, you know, binaries or code or do like, you know, a git sync and build or whatever you need to do as part of this. Um, but it's also very useful for bootstrapping more functional, uh, uh, more complicated and comprehensive management frameworks. So it's like it's just enough to get you started and then you can just take it from there. So here's an example. So we're taking that original example that, of, of uh, the Sierpinski's triangle uh, gasket that, uh, that Evan did. And, and I got to commend him for actually doing a demo with a word like Sierpinski in it. And, uh, and we're specifying all that as a startup script. 
And so this virtual machine will boot and it'll immediately start executing this code. And if you want to actually see what's happening, go in there and touch it and feel it, you can actually SSH in and you can actually uh, uh, look at a log of, of what's going on. So we actually save that data away for, for debugging purposes. Now when you add all this stuff together, we're actually talking about uh, a sort of a change in how you think about building things from thinking about uh, building servers to building services. And, um, and this helps deal with the reality of what it means to run in a data center. Software and hardware will fail. And if you can launch more machines, if you can deal with more hardware, you're gonna have a lot more exposure to that failure. And so something that becomes a once in a while event becomes a, you know, it happens re regular, uh, 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 more often than you would like. Hopefully not that often. Um, so we really uh, uh, want, want people to use uh, patterns where they build across zones. They think about using that ephemeral disk as really a cache or a scratch area. You build automation either through, you know, you're building your own systems, building on top of App Engine, which is a great uh, infrastructure for, for building the automation to manage this stuff. Or by part, you know, uh, uh, using, you know, one of our partners like RightScale or Puppet or OpsCode to do this stuff, or any, any number of a, uh, open source projects which are built to do this type of orchestration role. Now, one other thing that I want to mention here is that during our limited preview, we're going to have these things that we're calling maintenance windows, where we're actually going to be updating uh, both our, our hardware and software in the data centers that we're running in. And so this will be up to two, two weeks every 20 weeks. Um, we're going to work to keep these things as short as possible. We're going to only do one at a time, and we're going to give you plenty of warning. Um, but I think this is an example of, of, of what it means to actually be in a data center and have, having to deal with, uh, with regular maintenance. We're going to be addressing this in future visions. This is not something that uh, uh, is, is going to be a, a long-term quality of the system. And so with that, I'd like to invite you all to apply to our limited preview program. Um, uh, like I said, we're starting with large-scale compute. And uh, as we are able to build out our capability to take customers on, we'll be expanding that, and we'll be expanding the number of customers. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer them. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's uh, Evan and... Uh, and the other team members are here also. You know, step up to the microphone. Yes. Hello, I have a question. Um, how about, perhaps not now, but later, uh, government compliance like, uh, for, your, for the data, data transport and all that kind of thing? I'm sorry, I... I, I a government, a, like a HIPAA or something like that, PCI compliance. Um, uh, Craig, do you want to uh, answer <laughs> this? Sorry. So, the, so, the, so, so I'd like to introduce Craig McLucky is the, uh, the lead product manager for uh, Google Compute Engine. Hey, how are you doing? Um, so the question was around uh, compliance? Yeah, the, the question is basically, uh, do you guys plan or have already some sort of uh, compliance certification like the HIPAA or something like that? That's a great question. Um, obviously, for a lot of businesses, uh, compliance is critical. At this point, we haven't started focusing on compliance uh, you know, related issues. It's something we'll absolutely consider as we move forwards, but I can't actually make any clean statements about that right now. Okay. Uh, two questions. What is the key for the persistent storage being stored? What is the key? Yeah. Um, uh, deep experience with running distributed systems. Um, uh, so, so I think the question was, where is the key? Oh, where's the key? Stored? Oh, okay. So. Um, <laughs> what is the key, <laughs> uh, uh, or where is the key? Oh, so where? we store that in our in our our, our management infrastructure. Um, but uh, Google has a bunch of systems in place to actually isolate and further encrypt that key to control it with with uh, key rotation policies. And I think this really comes back to the. Um, to the compliance issue. I mean, that's the type of thing that we'd like to document and provide some exposure into as we, as we, uh, as we move down those paths. But, but we're very careful to make sure that, um, that we control access to that key and, and securely know how to delete it. Uh, my second question is, um, I, I know with Google App Engine, you have the scheduler that'll spin up new instances based on a load balancer and number of hits. Um, since you have public-facing IPs, is there a plan to have the, some sort of load balancer to, to push into that, or are they just going to be more back-end instances? Um, so this is, this is definitely um, you know, a, a feature that we're missing right now, and it's um, one of the reasons why we're concentrating on these, these uh, batch workloads. Um, and we're, you know, as we continue to develop the product, that's, that's the type of thing that we're going to want to address. And, the, and using BGP to get the traffic off the net onto your local networks and route it into the... Um... Actually, what we're doing is we're advertising all these IP addresses with um, Anycast. 
and, uh, and no matter where they are, we get them onto Google's network, and then we uh, encapsulate it and, uh, and then forward it on with your uh, virtual network. Um, so, so uh, yeah, there's BGP to get the data you know, as, as soon as possible, but we're actually, um, you know, like I said, anywhere in the world, we try and get it on our network as fast as possible. Thank you. Sir, I have another question. Um, hey, when you provision a project, um, does that provision the virtual private network automatically for you? So any instance in that project will automatically be part of that virtual private network? Uh, yeah, I, th there's a little bit of detail that I glossed over, and if you dig into the, into the API docs, you'll see this. Um, you can actually have multiple virtual networks, as many uh, as you want, um, uh, in your project. Um, we create one called default by default, and all our tools are built to reference that project by default. So um, we find that, that most users don't need more than the one virtual network, but there's gonna be a couple of situations where, where you're gonna wanna have separate VMs running their own isolated virtual networks. Just a quick follow-up question to that. Um, I believe you said that uh, all the instances across uh, different regions in that project will be covered under the same um, virtual private network? Yes. All right. And then that, that never, or almost never, I suppose, hits the actual internet. It goes through your pipeline, right? Right, exactly. So if you're communicating between two virtual machines, over this private network, this private virtual network across regions, it will stay within Google's network as we do that. And so, uh, and we can control, you know, we can provide a much more consistent experience and much more secure and sort of easy by default experience with moving data between regions. Yeah, thank you. If I launch, say, four instances, um, is there a guarantee they won't be on the same hardware? Um, or is there some risk I could end up running my, all my VMs on the same piece of equipment? That's a, that's, a, uh, that's a great question. I think um, we try hard to make sure that that doesn't happen right now. We don't offer any guarantees, um, but uh, that's definitely something that we're thinking about. Cool. I don't know that I could actually do that on purpose if I wanted to, but there's a chance. What that? Oh, launch. Oh, I was saying that I don't know that I could actually get four, vir you know, if I launched four virtual machines from the API, that I could get them to land on the same machine, you know, if I tried, but there's a chance. Yeah, I, I mean, just to be clear, I mean, for our own testing, we, we do sort of what we call stack testing, where we try and load as many VMs as possible on a single physical machine to test out this consistency. And we've had to do some specialized things to actually force them to land on the same machine for those cases, so, yeah. Um, can I specify the IP space within, the, within my project? Uh, the IP space for the, for the virtual network? Yes. Uh, yes, you can specify, I believe, any, any 1918 um, yes. IP space. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, within a project, or, um, so the, the use case I ha I'm thinking about is, you know, I have development teams that I want to g basically give them a project, um, and they need to talk to each other, but they, can I isolate one development team from terminating resources and in instances of another, uh, in another project based on, like, uh, if, some sort of role, or? If those two, if you have two separate projects, yep. um, they will be isolated from each other. Okay. So. And what if I wanted the two projects to talk to each other? Should I not use projects then? Should I use one project with? At well, so, so um, what you can do is you can actually add the service account from one project to the team of the other project. And so you can give one project nice. permission to actually call the uh, compute engine API of the other project. And so, you know, it's, the interesting thing about service accounts is you can add them to any other ACL, right? It's, 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 it's really sort of like a synthetic user. You mentioned that you can re, uh, mount a persistent storage device read-write on a single instance or read-only on multiple instances. Can you do that simultaneously? Read-write no. on one and, okay, so it's read-only on yeah. all, and then you have to unmount. Linux doesn't like it when you do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are specialized <laughs> file systems that actually do deal with multiple parties you know, partying on the same disk at the same time. It's relatively esoteric, and, and one of the, the ways that we can get the type of performance that we can is by doing a fairly aggressive sort of caching and mapping uh, at, on the same machine as, as, the, right. uh, as the image. Thank you. I mean, as the uh, virtual machine, yeah. Uh, hey, is it possible to run Asterix on top of the compute engine? Uh, I don't know if anybody has, but there should be no reason why you couldn't. Um, oh, in fact, okay. Um, we were just talking about uh, uh, with uh, uh, one of the members of the WebRTC team about him 
using a uh, compute engine to actually run some, some code to test out you know, real-time communication. So that's, uh, that's definitely something that we think is appropriate for compute engine um, okay, and eventually. Another, yeah. And another question, would we be getting some free instances to try it out? Um, so, Craig? <laughs> so yeah, so the, uh, we invite you to apply to the program. Um, obviously, so, so we have a program, uh, which is a limited preview program. Mm -hmm. And uh, folks that we accept into that program will absolutely get some free instances. Now, obviously, um, there's a pretty high demand for free compute. Uh -huh. um, so we can't give it to everybody right away. So, so please do apply to the program. I just give a little description of the specifics of the workload. Uh -huh. um, and uh, and you know, we'll, we'll put you into the queue. And as soon as we can service that, we'll, we will offer you um, access. We also want to make sure that our first customers for the limited preview have a really good support experience as well. So that's another reason why we're limiting the total number of people to start with. Absolutely. OK, thanks. Hi, uh, I would like to know how much is the lag between the app engine and the, um, the service, and if it's feasible to tie the zone that is running the, the instances with my app engine app. So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't quite understand. So, so app engine and compute engine. How much is the lag? Like oh, the, the lag. The round trip between. Uh, so. Adam did some, some experiments recently, I think. Um, yeah, we, we don't have numbers we can publish right now. Yeah. What we can say is that um, a lot of our early partners and our early customers that have used the service have been extremely impressed by our very high-speed global network backbone that all of this is running over. Uh, so we, um, you know, we don't make any strong guarantees about that latency, but our early users have been consistently impressed with their ability to access other services like Google, um, a Google App Engine or, or a Google Storage product or anything else that's in the Google portfolio of technologies. Um, so you know, if you have access, do try it out. Um, let us know. Thank you. And with that, I, th I think we're out of time. Um, uh, I thank everybody for coming. Um, feel free to grab us. I think, are, do we have the booth tomorrow or? Um, yeah, we'll be at the booth. Um, so stop by and yeah. say hello. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy answering the questions and I want to continue doing so, but we're out of time. Thank you very much.